Okay, two minutes ago. Turn up the music a little and hope that people enjoy. Okay, and we're live. Hello everyone, welcome to Tales of Swordfall, or at least the GM part of it. Um, hopefully I can be kind of entertaining, or at least informative today. Uh, today I'm talking about Session Zero. Uh, what happens before Session Zero, what happens during Session Zero, and if you watch our Session Zero you might know a little bit of that, and also uh, what happens after and what you do before the game um, and also I'll talk about the tools I use to prep for a game uh, it should be pretty interesting today hopefully so big question is what is session zero um this is like in Hollywood, it would be a pitch to a producer, or um, you're trying to get people really interested in what you're doing, and also you're asking what you can do for the people involved. So in this case, session zero is, I have an idea. Um, let's just say I get a group of people together who are I know are interested in playing D&D uh, &D and... I say to them, hey guys, I've been having this idea in my head for the longest time. I want to play 
a sky pirate D and D game where we treat everything like a trashy romance novel, and then we discuss it. Um. Uh. So during session zero, usually, if we're not familiar with the people, we ask. Well. A GM should ask several questions, uh, especially to their players. Uh, one thing is, are you comfortable actually doing this? Like, I know for a fact that not everybody's a fan of trashy romance novels, or Sky Pirates, or Flying in the Air. And, you know, some people might just opt out right then and there. And it's like, uh, okay, well, it was an idea... But some people might be totally enthusiastic about it. You never know until you actually just try to come up with an idea and ask. Um, also another thing that's really polite to do, when you, especially if you're with a whole bunch of new players or people you don't know, is that you should ask them if they have anything that will, well, for lack of a better word, trigger them. Uh, you want everybody at your table to be comfortable. It's not really fair to spring something up on a person and expect them to roleplay something that they're afraid of, or scared of, or brings up bad, horrible memories. I and mean, you don't want to do that. It's just uncool. So what do you do before session zero? Some might be asking, or no one's asking, whichever. Um, for me, I just come up with a concept. Maybe I'll come up with a name of a kingdom, or a scenario in my head. You know, stuff like that. Uh, for this one, I thought of a giant doom sword floating in the air over a city and I'm like hey that's a cool idea I'm gonna try to use this for this campaign um also I had the inclination of uh getting a lot of people who are new to D&D &D or D&D &D 5e and introducing or going over the rules with them and seeing what would happen and also try to live stream all of it uh it's a crazy idea but I think so far it's working. Um, so, uh, a lot of people before session zero, uh, they have a tendency to, like, prep a lot, make a whole kingdom, uh, make up their own races, make up their own storyline, or even they pick up a book, a module, whatever. Um, and some of them are like the Curse of Strahd, um, which is always a personal favorite of mine. I always like D D vampires; they've been fun. Also, uh, Storm King's Thunder. That was another one that uh, D D published. Tomb of Annihilation. Um, what, Princess of Evil, I can't remember all the names of them, but uh, usually a module is a pre-made adventure uh, that can be for certain levels of characters that you go through with your group, and they can be fun. They can be a lot of fun. I personally like to give my games a personal touch and get personal with them, I guess. If I'm going to use the word personal a lot, let's use it right now. Um, and there's also other companies that sell, uh, D&D 5e adventure modules, um, and they're all, well, not all of them are equal, and, uh, you really have to just check it out, be a good judgment, and see what your group really wants to do. I mean, 
maybe your group doesn't want to do a gothic adventure like Curse of Strahd, but they want to fight a bunch of giants and go into a murder mystery. I, I don't know. Groups sometimes are strange like that. Um, but for this game, I'm doing something that's called homebrew. That's when you just make your own world not really based off of any of the material that's already published and you do your own thing. Uh, for this, I basically have the world sort of hashed out. And this is a map of the city uh, that I had the idea of. Um, we'll get into how I made this map later, but this is Swordfall of the Kingdom of Swordfall. Not very creative name, but it kind of stuck. And this could have been any city map, but I chose this one. This one looks cool. I like cities with rivers going through them. I'm kind of a sucker. Uh, so, I've done Session Zero. You can watch that all uh, on our YouTube channel. It's fully recorded on there. But what's next? What do I do now? There's still two days left, and... Yeah, there's two days left, and... Do I have anything? Am I planning on anything? Yes and no. Um, some people will take this time, or will take the time between they pitch the game and we're like, okay guys, let's make the characters and then we'll do something. Uh, if you have a module, it's a lot easier to just kind of break out the book, start in a place, and start going. Uh, well, it's not that easy as the person in charge, you kind of have to read ahead and make sure that you know what's going on. Uh, for homebrew games, there's a lot of people out there who will uh, go out, take a few weeks, and prep a whole world and situations, uh, sometimes make factions, and down to sometimes even making their own language for a game. I not one of those people. I kind of do things a little bit more loose, and I'm very prep light, which seems disappointing to some people, but that's kind of how I roll. I like to make a game so my players have room to explore, my players have room to put in their own input into the world, and so that everyone feels like they have some kind of, in, well, any kind of interaction with the world around them, and then the self, self as players have a lot of agency in the world, and that they don't feel like, oh yeah, this world is just this dude's vision of everything, and I'll never get a say in it. Um, yeah, I mean, so far the prep I've done for this is this kind of blotchy map. So I have, of course, our main city in the very middle. And then I have a city right there, a city right there, purple things, green things, and blue things. Uh, this is basically a kingdom map. Uh, you can find descriptions of kingdom maps in the Dungeons Master Guide. Um, so each hex is about three miles, if I remember correctly. Um, so yeah, it's a very wide area map. And this is what the 
players are going to do, uh, well, have their characters exploring and help build up the world as we go on. Um, it's kind of a fun thing when you, as the person in charge, you're not sure what's going to happen. Um, and how I do this is I use random tables, I use random encounters. Um, let's just say that my characters want to head to the mountains over this way, and they're going to have to travel a long way. So between like the city and here, I mean, there's a giant question mark. That doesn't really look like a question mark, but hey. So, what do I use to fill that in? Um, about a year ago, I made a very long random table that um, I love to use. Of course, it's like since I made it, I love to use it. Uh, some people find it a little overbearing. Um, but originally it's based off of a survival role, and depending on how well they did, good things and bad things can actually happen within their travels. Um, I use this for a particular game I run on Sundays. I call it the Sunday Drop-In Game. Um, when it used to actually be people, random people would come in and come out uh, to just join up with this D&D game. And the principle was it was a very open world where everybody, every character, had an impact on the world in some way. Uh, discover a town and you name it, like, Sucky Town, and that's what we kind of use it for ever. Well, let's see if I can find my random table. Yeah, so on here, I have just a lot of stuff that I use during gameplay. Uh, creatures, monstrosities, villainous encounters, just travelers' discoveries. Um, yeah, and when I typed it out and had it in a Word, Word document, it was well over 100 pages. It was uh, kind of a monster. But... I use this because it's fun. Uh, let's just say that somebody rolled an okay roll while they're out and about and discovering the world. So uh, they roll, you know, 11 to 15. That's a pretty good roll when doing a survival out there. And uh, so using survival, that would be like checking for paths. Uh, making sure you have enough like food and water, everyone's traveling at certain paces, all that stuff. Stuff that you're doing out in the world to survive. So, I have all this stuff listed. Of course, you know, their travels can be uh, uneventful. Uh, but, Let's just say they got kind of a middle thing, and they got a discovery and a villainous encounter. Uh, discoveries. I would have them roll, once again, more stuff, and, uh, whoops, I lost my place. There we go. 
have them do a D100, and I have a lot of stuff on here. Um, structures, water features, hermits even, towns, craters, man-made monoliths. I mean, it's pretty extensive, the list I make. I mean, not everyone has the time or is crazy enough to make a giant list of random things that people can actually watch or discover along their travels. But that's one of the tools that I use amongst many. Of course, uh, Roll20 is definitely a tool that I use constantly uh, just for making things, um, finding beasts along the way, that kind of stuff. Um, because Roll20 has a really cool system now where everything's cataloged, and if I need to find a bugbear to use for one of my encounters, there's a bugbear, just drag and drop, and I get all that. There's a character sheet I can use. I can make the bugbear, you know, throw a javelin. Woo! So yeah, <laughs> after session zero, I kind of got off topic there. Um, yeah, there's some prep involved. So, what I have been doing the last... Uh, after we did Session Zero, we've made characters. Everybody had a background, and everybody had something to do with your past that... Well, not everybody had this, but most of the characters, I think three out of four, have paths where stuff can come up again, and certain characters need to be made. Um, so during... Last week, after I talked to the players and asked them a few more follow-up questions, which I thank all my players for putting up with me in my persistent questioning of their characters and what their pasts were like, because um, I just like to squeeze that much more detail out of everything. But anyways, uh, I had to make some NPCs that are may or may not play a major role in upcoming events. Uh, they may never show up. They might actually show up, like, during a pivotal time. Who knows? Well, no, I should know. Yeah. So, the tools I use. I have a lot of tools I use other than Roll20. Roll20 is awesome. It, um makes hex maps really well, um, but if I'm planning something like encounters, if I need an in-game calendar to just keep track of days, months, years, whatever, Roll20, you can like uh, make documents for that. I have the sound on somewhere. Um, yeah, so... I made a calendar just so the players and I can t keep track of their days, how long in-game their characters have been doing stuff. I Usually that's useful. That's one thing I did, but... I did not make it alone. I did not figure any of this Moonface stuff alone. I actually used a website. Uh, dungeon. It's actually a French word for dungeon. Uh, it has a lot of useful tools. So many useful tools. I can't even begin how useful this website has been. And if you are running a game and you just 
need stuff. This is an awesome, 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 awesome site to go to. Um, as you can tell with this, it has 5U stuff, but even the general stuff, or the fantasy, fantasy, fantasy stuff, is really awesome. Um, like, if you need a whole landmass and world, you can make just a world and a map with land masses. That's awesome. Uh, they have the calendar generator, which I used. And you can have multiple moons, you can have many days, many months, and they have it in such a way where you can save your work, look at it again, and go up years, down years, and it's pretty cool. I love this. I love using it, and it makes a world feel a little bit more full when there's actually a calendar involved. Uh, another awesome thing they have on here is the medieval demographic uh, calculator. And it's pretty cool. You can, you know, make up a kingdom name. Um, the kingdom of begun. And let's just put in 50,000 square miles. And let's make it a settled place. And it's been the kingdom for 500 years. And so it just gives me a lot of information here. And it's pretty cool. And the kingdom has 9 million people. Well, that's cool. Um, yeah, it tells me the largest city has 48,000 people. And when I click that, it takes me to the large, largest city. I can always change the name. Uh, the city of Stain and Begone. Because of Stain Begone. And what I really like about this is... It tells me how many possible inns can be in the city, um, how many possible taverns, wine cellars, carpenters, like, all this information that you may not need, but it's always fun to have. Hey look, they have 219 barbers. Sweet. Another thing I really like about uh, Dungeon, just the website in general, is their 5e stuff. They have a monster list, which I think is one of the more useful ones. Uh, they've updated it, so I think uh, up to Velo's Guide, so there's a lot of creatures. If I need a tiny creature that's a celestial, well, there's none of those. How about, uh, take out tiny? Just put in celestial. And there we go. Got the whole list. And, um, the cool thing about this is if I just need a reference, it tells me the actual source monster manual page 250. Cool, I'll go there. Uh, I think that's Volo's Guide 163 for the Kirin. Stuff like that. And I think that's pretty cool. Uh, also, this site comes with an encounter size calculator, which I think everybody needs to at least consider. Um, so let's make it medium line encounter for four people. I'm gonna have first level characters. Oh hey look, you know, um we can make an encounter size that has ten zero level creatures, four to five one eight, and a level a CR one creature. Cool. What does that mean? Well I can go back to the monster list, look the CRs up, and start playing from there. Um, I find this a pretty fast way of actually 
making that kind of stuff. But there is another website which does encounters a little bit better, in my opinion. And that's Cobalt Fight Club. This site I have recently discovered, and I'm just blown away by it. It gives you the number of players, the level they're at. You can actually add more. Um, let's just say they're palling around with a fifth level. Or, no. One player that's fifth level. And it tells me, you know, what's an easy encounter, what's a hard, what's a medium. And. I can just start like plugging CRs. Well, let's see if I do like. Get that in. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna have them fight an Allosaurus. Alright, cool. That's within their easy range. Well, let's bump up the number to, you know, two Allosauruses. Well, it looks like it turns into a hard uh, situation for them might keep that. Of course, in the actual game that I'm running, there probably won't be any Allosauruses, but that would be awesome. Especially if they had lasers. Another website that I use, especially during game, when I just need an NPC right away, is this. RPG Tinker. It's a really good website. Um, they have templates that they use, and, uh, this is really easy to just look at, roll, and then leave caution to the wind. Uh, so, I want to make an NPC, that's uh, one hit dice, that's, uh, let's say a barmaid or keeper. Who is? Yeah, let's make them a drow for whatever reason. Uh, cool. They have like all the rays here: standard ray, medium ray. Uh, I'm gonna put them at poor because I don't really want them to be like a superhero or anything. And yeah, I'll keep them with the 1d8 health die. So I'm going to build that NPC, and it gives me a bar name for the, or the inn name, or tavern name. Or is that supposed to be an actual name for the character? I'm not quite sure, but yeah. There's a random name that's made. Gives me an armor class. Oh, look, they already have padded. Uh, they have four hit points, so they'll go down with a gust of wind. And, you know, it gives me, well, decent uh, stats because I did put it on poor ray. And look, you know, uh, their skills are perception, insight, and persuasion. Everything that a bar barkeep needs. Yeah, that's cool. I love it. So, talking about random names, I think that's one of the hardest things you can do on the fly, is just coming up with a random name that makes sense, or is cool, or, you know, whatever. So, I really like this website. It's called Seventh Sanctum, and they have random name generators for days. I mean... Look, let's just make something really cool here. Okay, here's characters. What kind of characters can I have for end names for? Uh, let's do a general character generator. Let's just see what that's about. Oh, this actually gives me a description about a person, not an actual name. Whoops. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh... Deities. I always have problems with that. Well, once again, that's uh, 
an actual generator for a god, but that's cool. Okay, I need names. How about I go to something. Names and naming. Ha! Huh. Extreme fantasy names. That sounds like uh, what we need. Hey, Bane Lord Slayer. Exactly. That's a fabulous name. Or Flora Sunset. Grail Fawn Noble or Fauna Noble. That's cool. Sometimes they have extremely silly names. Uh, let's go to. Um, they have Greek namers, quick character namers. Uh, oh! Uh, dark Elf names. There we go. And we had 20 names, so we can just choose from right there. Zaro. Yeah. Let's totally have that happen. Um, yeah, this is just a fun website to play around with. Uh, it comes with, up with some bizarre but good names. I think they even have a story hook, which sometimes actually gives me ideas. Humor and magic. Fandom. Organizations are always a good uh, random name. Like, hey, if we need a magic guild, let's click there. Uh, maybe in this world I will make the... Oh, what's a cool one? Mysterious Nightingale Guild. Well, that's a little uh, Elder Scrolls. But that's cool. Uh, talking about names and naming characters. There's behindthename.com. This is a pretty awesome site. Um, you can look up real world names from all over the world. It will actually give you the meanings. Oh, hey, random name right there. Uh, let's see. I want a hillbilly name that uh two middle names I want for a lady oh I can generate a live story and let's just make That person. Corn Pusher Bobby Ann Burl Lapper Wow. That's a name. But look. Gives me a whole name. Gives me the basics of the person. Uh, they're feminine. They're an elderly adult. They're American and from Kentucky. They're ages 66. Yeah, this is pretty awesome, especially if you're doing a um, contemporary game where you just need to make up people on the fly. I mean, hell, they even have blood type. That's pretty impressive. Uh, so the next thing is maps. I mean, those are hard. Well, for me, they're hard. For other people, they sneeze them out, and I'm jealous. But this website is pretty awesome. I'll uh, make sure that all these websites actually get into the description down below, um, especially this one, because it is the fantasy cities dot what about w a t a b o U dot R U, and this makes random city maps. That's actually what I'm using for the uh, current map. That's for the Wednesday game, and they have all sorts of features that you can turn on and off. Uh, let's go to style, uh, no layout, continuous. So, oh, turn off random. 
So if I don't want to have walls, I wanted to have a shanty town. Um, let's definitely do a river, but let's not do a coast. And I'm going to make a small town. There we go. And I just hit export, and I have a map. Or I want a large town with that. And I have that monstrosity. And the cool thing is you can, you know, put your mouse over anything, and it does give you basically, oh yeah, this is this section, this is that section. Um, oh, there's even a park in there now. And they have little farms out here. It's pretty awesome. Uh, my only complaint is here you can't zoom in or zoom out. But the image quality is really good uh, when you actually do finally export. Um, the city definitely needs walls. Maybe not the shanty town. Yep. That's a pretty awesome site to have. I mean, I can't stress how many times my party has found a town. And they're like, hey, do you have a map? And I'm like, uh, no, this was a random event. I was not even prepared. Now I can just go, hey, yeah, here's a map. Now, another thing I have found that's uh, not continents, but on a smaller scale, is this random, uh, it basically makes random islands. Uh, this is pretty cool, especially if you're doing some kind of seafaring game, or even if you want to just, like, be, hey, this is the island that your characters live on. I, they have a lot of different options uh, for this, and it's just awesome. Oh, yeah. Just make a random map. Uh, that one's a little boring. I like that one a little bit better. Islands with little other things. That's awesome. But yeah, if I ever need an island, or I'm pre-planning an adventure on just a solo like area, this is pretty good. I mean, um, it's not like the fractal fractal world map that this play uh, that dungeon has um, but it's pretty awesome and then finally this is a speech accent archive as a game master a dungeon master a narrator whoever I mean, you want to imply different voices, or you're really inclined to use different voices, so you can actually differentiate your NPCs, because if everyone is talking like this, then you don't know who's talking after a while, especially if the GM is having their own conversation amongst NPCs. So, trying to distinguish, like, different voices, it, it can be really hard, and you can really try to, uh, make an accent, but this actually lets you hear other accents, and it's really cool. If you're someone who can pick up accents by just listening to them, this is a great website, and it lets you uh, search um, yeah, it lets you search by the atlas. So let's say I'm going to run again I'm going to have, you know, Eastern European, Mid-European people in here. I'll just kind of go there. I'll look for... There's U Ukraine. And hey, there is uh, some someone from Kiev. And they're going to ask me to please call Stella. Um, this is a cool little... Act exercise if you ever want to hear your own accent. Um, basically, it's something that's hitting 
uh, what's the principle behind this? I think it's hitting every vowel combination and um, constant sounds that you can find in American English. So, yeah, I mean... Uh, please call Stella. Ask her to bring these things with her from the store. I don't know how much of that I can actually play, but yeah, it's just people saying the same phrase over and over again. And as I said, if you're good at picking up accents from just listening to them, this is an awesome website. <sighs> well, it doesn't look like anyone's actually in the chat, and... No one's there. Well, um, I'm going to call it there. Uh, hopefully everybody's been enjoying this uh, little live stream. Um, I wish I had more to answer, but I guess right now I'll just have to let it be. Um, but if uh, you do want to contact me or follow me on social media. I am at Paul underscore Garish on Twitter. And my phone is going off, so I better stop right here.